Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 245, recorded Monday, April 11th, 2016. James Gosling. Triangulation is brought to you by PillPack, a full service online pharmacy that combines modern technology, convenient packaging, and personalized service to make your life easier. Visit PillPack.com slash twit to save $20 on vitamins and OTCs when you transfer your prescriptions. And by Texture, the mobile app that lets you access the world's most popular magazines anytime, anywhere using your phone or tablet. For your free trial, visit Texture.com slash triangulation. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get together with some of the most interesting people in technology and we get to spend an hour with them talking about anything they want to talk about, really. Um, uh, for those of you tuning in, wanting to see the second half of our incredible interview uh, last week with Bill Atkinson, we haven't decided yet. I think that's going to uh, come up in a couple... When is... Are we going to air that, Karsten, next week? Or We don't We don't know yet. We But we, we have... He did three hours with us, so we divided it into two and much more with Bill Atkinson. Really great stuff. And he's also going to come back because he said, well, would you mind, because I really want to uh, promote this photo card, <clears throat> which he calls his greatest invention ever. I really want to show people how to use it. And I said, come back, anything you want to do, Bill is okay with me. But I am thrilled this week to introduce our guest, who is also legendary, uh, a, a brilliant computer scientist who has found the means to continue programming his entire life. And I guess if you're one of the creators of Java, you, des you earned that. James Gosling he is here with us uh, today, and it's really a pleasure to meet you, sir. Thank you for joining us today. Well, I'm uh, happy to be here. Um, I'm not going to begin with Java. I want to go back even farther. I like to ask people. First of all, I just read uh, on Hacker News a... Um, a very sad piece by somebody who said, I wish I hadn't stayed a programmer. Here I am at the age of 59, and I missed all the opportunities that I would have gotten had I gone into management. You, you, you seem to be pretty gainfully employed, and are you happy continuing to write code? I, I am completely thrilled writing code. All of my worst hours are, you know, when I'm in meetings, talking to people, when I'm, like, not coding. It... it I don't know. I just I just get no joy from managing. I'm I'm awful at it. My my experiments in in management have been <laughs> just. I just don't want to do it. I don't blame you. Uh, but you of course uh, found a niche that you really enjoy too. What? So let me let's go back to the beginning. When did you when did you discover computing? Uh, we're the same age. Uh, when when you and I were in college, it was big computers, usually in the special room in the basement. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I I, I grew up in you know kind of backwoods Canada. Um, Calgary. My parents, Calgary. Yeah, which at the time was was not terribly big. Um, it it had a had a university, which at the time was relatively small. It did have a data center and. We lived about three miles from it, and um, one day when I was like, I just like turned fourteen, my dad, um, a friend of my dad, um, worked at the university, and we wandered over for a tour, and uh, we just kind of like wandered through the buildings, and we walked through the the data center, and. I just thought it was the coolest looking thing ever. It, it didn't make any <laughs> sense to me, but it was really, really cool. But, you know, I was, you know, this, this like somewhat tall 14 year old. And, and I started just going over there and, you know, reading books and, you know, it, it didn't take very long to figure out how to, um, dumpster dive to get, you know, login IDs to the, 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 <laughs> IBM 360s and wow. Um, of course, the really interesting machines were the the, the sort of small um, PDP-8s. 
Because um, they were and, closer to something that you could, you know, you could own instead of timeshare. Well, it wasn't so much about owning. They they just had stuff connected to them. Ah. Um, like like vector displays and d displays and and um, keyboards and key punches and tape mm -hmm, drives mm -hmm. and stuff that you could like touch and whatever and you know the one of the things about universities is that that that, that if you just kind of bluster your way through. Um, they just kind of figure you're supposed to be there because it's filled with students who are always kind of like strangers, right? The, <laughs> right. The, the staff always expect un unusual people to be wandering through. And if you you kind of act like you're supposed to be there, they just sort of assume you are. Um, and, um, you know, a bunch of the a bunch of the doors to like like where where all the PDP-8s were, they had these um, these these rather primitive keypad entry systems. And, you know, if you just, like, stand around nonchalantly, it's really easy <laughs> to figure out what the magic key code is. I love it. So I did a lot of that, and um, I got to be friends with a number of the folks there, and I, I pretty much taught myself to program by, 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 by breaking in and um, spending endless hours in the, in the, in the computer center's library and um got to know a bunch of the folks there and um you know they they you know anybody who asked who I was and what I was doing I was always completely honest about what I was doing um and then they probably were thrilled that you were interested right yeah it, well a smart and then, kid, then, right? then, then then some folks from the physics department hired me um you know, because I, I I sort of knew what to do, and I was really cheap. <laughs> and you know, when you're a research project, you know that's an important thing. Um, you know, so I spent most of my high school years with this um, strange job writing uh, ground station software for the the ISIS two satellite. No kidding! How interesting! Yeah, it was it was <laughs> kind wow. Of, right, I, I I I skipped a lot of school. Um, and my <laughs> teachers were strangely happy with it. Um, <laughs> no kidding. I'm just writing know. some satellite software. And no big deal. Well, you know, they, they, they kind of figured out what I was doing and they, they, they apparently did a little bit of cross checking. And since just about everybody else, you know, who was, who was doing this in the, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, the late sixties, early seventies and, um, yeah, you know, it was it was it was a pretty sketchy time, and you know everybody else who was, um, you know, ducking out of ducking out of class was, you know, they were they were they were high on something. Yeah, they were going out to smoke in the back, and you were going to write code. <laughs> would you would you write that code for the ISIS on a PDP eight? Yeah, well, it was the it was the ground station side. Oh, okay, and, and that and was a was, PDP eight. Yeah, well, it was, some of it was was on an on IBM you know 360 series some of it was on a pdp8 and some of it was on a cdc um 6400 all the all the heavy duty numerical stuff was on the on the cdc machines but the stuff that took the the um analog telemetry sim signals and turned them into something that the cdc could read and actually a lot of the the um the error analysis and and, and correction and and was was all done on the on the on the PDP eight, and even even all of the the displays. Um, we did a lot of uh, interesting work um, putting images up on screens, um, and and of course back in those years, putting images on screens was quite a trick. It's so interesting that so many of the coders, at least of our generation, but I think even later. That was that's the kind of the seminal age fourteen, and if you were lucky enough to be exposed to a, a, a computer, you could you could you know call your own. A certain number of people just got became enthralled with it, and the the mind at that point, I guess, is is ready to ready to take it on. Were you writing in the assembler for the PDP eight? Um, well, certainly for the PDP eight, it was all assembler. An octal. <laughs> yeah, pretty. <laughs> well, no, there, 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 there was an assembly language compiler. Oh, good. For it, but <laughs> you were doing it. Was, it was pretty darn primitive. I mean, this is, 
This is a machine that had um, 4K memory banks, yeah. and you could add um, two or three additional memory banks for it. But um, you know, on this box, all the code had to fit in 4K, and then there was we had a second memory bank that we could um, tie into the display. Um, you know, so when everything has to pay, fit in something in a space that small, um, you know, coding is a different exercise. I mean, I, I it, it's almost comical the way people burn through RAM these days for code. Oh, I know. I actually have on order a PDP-8 front face with the switches, but in, in behind it, it's a Raspberry Pi, a $35 Raspberry Pi emulating uh, the PDP-8. So which so which PDP eight? Because their front faces are somewhat dif it's different. A, it's I've an eight I. Oh, an eight I with yeah. the with the, um, the the flat toggle switches. Yeah, the ones that rock. Yeah, the rocker switches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, that that is the one to get. The 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 the, the eighter ones, the eight E and the eight L that have the the, the paddle switches. Those those suck. <laughs> um, uh, my friend Steve Gibson, who does one of our shows, uh, has four of these, and he said he kind of fantasizes that when he retires and he doesn't have to write Windows code anymore, he'll be uh, he'll be uh, he wants to write a PDP-8 operating system. <laughs> um, well, I I have written an awful lot of PDP-8 code. You want to help him? Uh, <laughs> and PDP-8. Uh, bootloaders. Um, That's what he cut his teeth on, like you. Yeah, I mean yeah. the thing about the 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 the, the switches on the eight i the 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 sort of rounded, uh, flattish toggle switches, was you could take your fingers and swipe left and right and and do like a series of <laughs> a little, buttons a really arpeggio. really quickly. <laughs> so so if you want to like clear the the register to zero, you just have to. Like stick your finger on on one side and swipe to the other. Oh wow! <laughs> um, and it was the, the ones that have the like the little toggle flip blade switches. Yeah. Those were a pain in the ass. <laughs> um, and if you were trying to like toggle in uh, a a bootloader, you you really really cared about the shape of the switches. No kidding, that's a lot of yeah. flipping. Yeah. Holy cow. I'm so happy I'm not doing that anymore. Yeah. So you weren't using a terminal. You were actually, you had to, f well, for the bootloader, you couldn't, right? You had a, right, that was right. the first code. So you had to do right. that with the toggle switch. How many switch flips was that? Um, it was actually not a lot. There was effectively, you know, this, this, this like competition on, you know, how small bootloaders <laughs> right. could be. And, and you could actually do a pretty, pretty credible one. It was depend depended a lot on what you were booting from, right? You know, so so typically you'd have a bootloader that 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 read the second level boot bootloader um, off of a paper tape reader, you know. So right. so that bootloader would be sort of a dozen instructions. Oh, that's not. And true. then the then the then the, the tape text. Then over. off of the then off the paper tape reader, you'd read another one that would be about 128 words. Right. Um, because 128 words, you just never get it right. <laughs> um, but you know, several of us had gotten to where the 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 the, the lowest level uh, boot sequence that you had to toggle in by hand. You know, we just had to, like completely memorized. <laughs> um, you know, it's you know, in in that part of your brain that resides in your knuckles. Do you think you could still do it if we uh, brought you a PDP AI? Uh, not a chance. <laughs> not a chance. <laughs> come back to you <laughs> not a chance although 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 i i um not very long ago i was um talking with a friend and we were um i, I think you know i've certainly got the instruction set completely memorized steve loves the instruction set one of the reasons he, he likes having a pdp8 he says it was a it's a very orthogonal nice simple instruction set very clean well it's really simple it it, it has but but that simplicity comes at a cost um, there are things about it because in, in, in sort of later years, I wrote a fair number of code generators for it. And, you know, the interactions between the instruction set and the memory model were unbelievably uh, bogus. Uh, and uh, the way that, I mean, addressing on that thing was just oh, so cheesy. <laughs> Couldn't be worse than x86, but maybe maybe it could. Um, I, I, 
oddly enough, it was actually worse than the original X86. Wow. Um, you know, the, the sort of modern processors that just have, you know, a 64-bit integer. That makes life so, so nice. Clean. Yeah. No segmenting. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you uh, apparently fell for this stuff because you, uh, you uh, got a master's and a PhD at uh, CMU. Mm -hmm. I presume, is it, was it in computer science? Yeah. 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 And uh, like any good programmer, you wrote your own version of Emacs. Um, yeah, that was, um, I did the, the very first one that, 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 that showed up on, on, on Unix and no kidding so through a, yeah, yeah. The, the, I got to know Emacs on Multics. Uh huh. I don't know if you remember Multics, sure. but a guy named, uh, Bernie Greenberg had written a version of Emacs in, in Lisp. And, um, I got to use that, I got to use that one for a, for a project that I did. I, I wrote, uh, a, uh, Pascal compiler. For, for Honeywell, they they hired me for a little while to write this Pascal compiler. Was it a which was, was it a P code uh, compiler? Um, no, it was native. No, it was a it was a straight from source code to um, Multics machine code. Oh, intriguing! I was going to uh, make a big thing over to Java, but no, no, I won't do that. Um. Yeah, yeah, no, the, <laughs> the, the, the 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 Multics machine was was a glory to behold. I'm uh. I'm still very wistful about you know the way that Honeywell basically destroyed it but what can i say mm. so uh, your 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 emacs was not in lisp though it was in c i think yeah in c yeah. yeah yeah so i mean the the original one was as as emac as the name emacs suggests it was a set of macros, macros for a text editor called tico oh yeah that's right yeah yeah uh, tico, i i got to use tico a lot at several phases of my life and Tico and line noise are pretty much the same thing. So, uh, and in a way, that's a claim to fame because the original GNU Emacs was your Emacs, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, it went through kind of a, a twisted path, but um, yeah, it sort of it sort of started there. Yeah. Um, so, how did you get to Sun? Um, when I, you know, so when I, when I was in grad school. Um, cause I was kind of the Unix guy. Um, and I, I, when I graduated for some reason that I really doesn't make any sense to me anymore. Um, I joined IBM to, to work on a project that, um, that was, that was fairly interesting. And, um, IBM wanted to build these machines that were sort of workstations and, um, you know, a bunch of the folks at Yorktown Heights Research Labs had this grand vision. I thought, oh, this would be really cool. And at about that time, I, um, cause I, cause I had gotten to know like Bill and Andy cause, um, Andy had actually been at CMU for a while. Mm. And, um, I, I, you know, as a grad student, one of, one of my tasks at one point was to, to help fabricate some boards that Andy had designed. Um, so I got to, got to know. Andy's design style, which was kind of adventurous. Um, <laughs> well, he always wanted to put like more stuff on a board than you actually could, so you, you know the you would have to like file the ends off of chips to get them to fit, or you'd have to do this like double stack thing where you put one chip on top of another chip and you you splay the legs out to, in order to oh, stuff it to the board. Um, <laughs> always really, always really pretty entertaining. But um, now, I when when um, Andy um, got together with with Scott and Vinod to to found Sun, um, I actually, by pure coincidence, was having lunch with Andy on on the day that he signed the papers, and um, he was like twisting my arm to to join Sun and, 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 you know, trying to get me to, um, to, to join on and help them out. And I'm like, but you're using like the Motorola 68,000 chip and that thing has got there. there, there. <laughs> and you know, these, uh, this, this, this IBM group has got a really cool chip that they're using for their main processor. You know, you're just going to die. And, um, was it power? I, was it the power 
PA Risk Power PC at that point, or it, it, no? It was it was the predecessor of that. It was a thing called the Romp. The Romp. And and what I what I really hadn't um, understood was IBM's incredible capacity mm. for shooting itself in mm. the foot. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, if if IBM merely shot itself in the foot, that would be fine. <laughs> that, that might be survivable, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so so like a year and a half later, um, uh, you know, after, after Bill Joy kept like dragging me, um, uh, you know, I eventually joined Sun, and uh, and uh, moved out to the Bay Area and have been here ever since. Quite legendary, of course. And Sun stood for the was it Stanford University Network, right? Because they were all Stanford. Well, it, well, it started out as as Andy's, um, I think, master's thesis project, mm -hmm. um, and so it was done. the The original board was done at Stanford by Andy, so it really was the Stanford University Network. Oh, interesting. Um, I'm sure they reaped some then, reward for that over time. Well, sure, you know. So, 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 so Stanford did 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 quite well. Right when you know this 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 board and the stuff that Andy had built um, worked out well, um, some some VCs uh, got um, Scott and Vinod to um, come together with, with with Andy to try to turn that into a, a company, and you know so they had some arrangement with with Stanford to to get the I, IP rights, and I know that you know. Stanford, you know, did pretty well by them. I'm sure, as they did by uh, Google and others. It's hey, if you, yeah. you know, if you incubate great companies like that, more power to you. Bill yeah. Joy, on the other, he was from Cal, right? He was he had done BSD yeah, he was, at Cal. He was from Berkeley. Yeah, so he was a Unix guy. Yeah, and um, and I I I gather that the strength of Sun was that you were able to make these sixty-eight thousand base computers running Unix. Uh, and yeah, high quality yeah, worked, graphics worked really well and and i mean the the the, the 68000 in the very first days of, of 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 sun they were a real problem um but then once the 68010 came out uh things got a whole lot better and then the 68020 was just a dream machine um we did a lot with the 68020 mm. a fl and a nice flat memory model, model as i remember yeah yeah, the the sixty eight hundred ten was was challenging. It didn't really have an MMU, or the sixty eight thousand didn't really have an MMU. The sixty eight ten came in with a a kind of okay MMU, and and then the, then the twenty came in. And it was just delightful, a real multiplier. Wow. Who knew? Who knew? We're gonna take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about uh, the birth of Java. Um, and boy, I remember that uh, very well. It was first Oak. Uh, Bill Joy came to you, I think, right, and said, let's do this thing. But I want to find out the story from the yeah. man, the father of Java. Uh, James Gosling is our guest. It's great to have him. And then later we're going to talk about programming robots for undersea exploration. That's kind of cool. Submarines. But first I want to talk a little bit about PillPack. Uh, this is this is an online pharmacy that has solved so many problems this is very common, you know, in the Internet era now. We're seeing um, companies move into spaces where, there, where there's an inefficiency. And in this case, the drugstore, we're in an old drugstore, you know. The, the pharmacy was right over there. I remember it. I used to, used, to go, used to get the Beanie Babies over there. Now we go to PillPack.com. PillPack.com uh, has pharmacists on duty 24-7, so you can call them anytime. And the Pill Pack is really the thing. So you get your medications or your vitamins in this great pill pack. Now, they also will ship ointments and inhalers, whatever. It can't go in here, but your, but your pills do. And look at this. So it's got your name and your date on it. It has an image of every pill that's in the pill pack. That's important because they're using sophisticated image recognition to make sure that the pill packs are properly packed. And then a pharmacist goes over it by hand to make sure, double-checked. You also have what's each pill is and the prescription that goes with it and the dosing directions and then when it comes time to take a pill look at that it has the day the date the time exactly what's in here these are easy open you just tear them open and there's and there's your pills just like that 
And the, the nice thing is, you never have to worry. Did I take, let me see, did I take my, uh, my pills this morning? You know, because you've torn it off. This is really great for travel. And by the way, parents, for your kids who are about to go to summer camp in a couple of months, summer camps love these. The nurse will thank you. She'll, this, you should do it for that alone. She'll say, oh, thank you. I know exactly when to give your child his medication or her medication, what the medications are. It's all in there. You just tear it off. And by the way, no additional cost. Your insurance, in most cases, will cover this. There's no additional fee. It's just your deductible. The, the shipping is free. It's easy to switch to. You can go to their secure site. It's very easy to use. They'll take care of everything for you. Uh, it is compatible with most major insurance plans, including most forms of Medicare Part D. Yeah, this is, this is really great. Uh, as you get older, I can vouch for the fact that it's easy to forget. <laughs> did I take... I can't remember. Did I take my vitamins this morning? Your pill pack. Your ne no more pill box to load up Monday through Sunday. You got your pill pack. And by the way, if you want to talk to a pharmacist, they're there 24-7. And it's, you can talk to them in the privacy of your own home. No more embarrassing conversations at the at the counter next to the Beanie Babies. When you need refills, they proactively contact your doctor to manage those, so you never run out. I love PillPack. By the way, if you refer someone to PillPack and they sign up, PillPack donates $100 to Rx Art. That's a nonprofit whose mission is to help children heal through the extraordinary power of visual art. And they have a medication reminder app for the iPhone and the Apple Watch, too. PillPack.com slash twit. Sign up now. When you transfer your prescriptions over, you get a credit for $20 worth of vitamins and over-the-counter medications. PillPack.com slash twit. It is a better, simpler pharmacy, and I think you're going to really love it. So thrilled to have our guest here, James Gosling, uh, Canadian. We point that out. We have many Canadian viewers, Calgary-born and bred, but he's in the South Bay now because he was, he was lured there by uh, Andy Bechtolsheim and Bill Joy and Scott McNeely and Vinod Koshla, who said, come to work for Sun. And uh, you did very early on. It was in the first couple of years of Sun. What, what were, were, were your first projects uh, software? Uh, they must have been, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 um, I, I sort of w was, w was hired to, like, figure out what I should do. And, <laughs> I love that. Um, That's respect. We'll let, well, we'll let you decide. They, 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 they had a they had a few software projects that were sort of scary, shimmery things, and and I had to like figure out which one to like dive into. And there was some um, really low level OS stuff in in um, the original um, Sun, Sun OS. Um, and since you know when I was at at at, at Carnegie, I had done things like. Um, porting porting Unix to a multiprocessor. I had done that a few years before I graduated to a to a sixteen way CPU wow. or sixteen CPU machine. Wow! And so I I spent a lot of time in in the land of you know Unix device drivers, and so there were some projects that 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 I uh, that Bill wanted me to look at, and um, and then there was some stuff in sort of graphics and user interface world and um there was more hair on fire in the in the in the graphics and user interface stuff so i bet there was um i i i ended up spending you know pretty much all my time early on doing graphics and ui stuff um which tended to in the early days in particular was um, a lot of time writing low-level device drivers to do you know all this crazy graphics rendering what do, you, do you like problems like that? What kind of problems do you like to solve? Um, kind of anything. Yeah. You know, I'm not. You know, I'm. I'm not exactly a, you know, pigeonholed kind of person. Uh, um, um, I'm, I'm the happy uh -oh. sort of our, anywhere. Our I, I guess I'm. I'm a little. I'm a little happier down in the plumbing than I am, um, up in the, the sort of you know, glossy layout stuff, but um, I'm kind of a happy all over the place. How did, uh, how did the idea for Java come about? Um, so Java was sort of a funny thing where um, 
uh, a, a small group of us folks at Sun, we kind of had this had this had this sort of group epiphany that uh, kind of the computer industry and Sun were were sort of missing out on on this this transition that was happening in the world, namely that. Um, all the all the piece parts that we were used to seeing inside computers were showing up outside of computers. So they were showing up in, you know, elevators and TV sets and VCRs, and you know, the, these things were all becoming digital, and they were getting all getting programmed. And you know, we had this 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 deep view that that this was going to be important. Um, you know, and it, you know, we're talking 1990 here, um, and you know, people in that world were largely unaware. Well, not exactly unaware. I mean, it was like dominated by, by electrical engineers who thought in terms of, you know, wires and chips mm. and stuff mm -hmm. um, and not really in terms of software. And so the whenever they built something that involved software, it was usually fairly grotesque. Um, and And so, you know, one of the nice things about Scott is that he would... Um, you know, if you had a, had a reasonably plausible case that there was something that needed looking into, you'd say, yeah, go off and look into it. Um, Scott so, McNeely, so yeah. yeah, so we, we, we went off and we, we did a bunch of touring around of consumer electronics companies in Europe and Asia and sort of collected a list of things that were problems and, um, you know, we, we thought that there was an interesting opening for the computer industry there. Uh, but we didn't really understand how that universe worked sort of in a sort of subatomic sub level. Um, so, you know, being fundamentally a bunch of engineers and one really sharp BD guy, um, we just decided to build a prototype system. And... As we were building this thing, which was, you know, if you looked at it, it would be uh, a handheld remote to, to to control things around you. Mm. Um, it was it was you can kind of think of it as an iPad twenty years before the iPad. Uh -huh. um, and oddly enough, some of the peop some of the hardware folks who built that thing ended up working on the iPad. Um, but as we were building it and thinking about how the that industry built software and how that software was entering people's lives we um we kept running into issues in the way that sort of c and c plus plus did things um and so my part of the project was was sort of go off and solve the the, the software development issues and um, that, you know, started off as, oh, okay, write a quick and cheesy C++ compiler and um, that sort of does C++ with some, some things fixed. And that then kind of mushroomed and grow, grew and, um, and it eventually became Java. But it wasn't, it wasn't like I, I, I woke up one morning and said, oh, I want to do a programming language. It was in the context of this project that had um, a set of problems to solve. Did you also have a, a real-time operating system, or how did, how did that work? Um, no, we weren't using a, a real-time operating system. We were actually just using um, Solaris. Really? Uh, wow. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the unknown secrets of, of Solaris is that it's actually an excruciatingly good real-time operating system. Interesting. Um, and the you, kernel's small enough to get in these constrained environments? And Yeah, I mean, once you, you know, throw away all the stuff that you don't need to run a big, big enterprise server, um, you know, the, the kernel inside Solaris is really pretty clean. Wow. And, um, you know, the way that it manages clocks and scheduling... Um, you know, it, it inherently has to be a real-time operating system in its heart because it's got all of these, you know, strange devices that it's talking to and it has to be able to schedule quite accurately. Um, you know, so it's, it's pretty much all there. Interesting. When did the, the idea of a, a, a JVM, a, an intermediate layer, come in? 
Um, that was actually when I was a grad student. Um, early on, so, so there used to be this this computer company in in Pittsburgh called Three Rivers Computers, and they made a a workstation like thing called the Perk, P E R Q, and um, it was it. it, it the, the company was a bunch of electrical engineers who didn't know much about software. And so they decided that um, instead of, like, investing in software, what they would do is just grab stuff that they could use for, for free. So they decided that they would build things around the, the, the UCSD Pascal compiler and its um, P-code engine. So they built a machine that would execute in hardware the the um, oh, wow. the Pascal P codes the the bytecode interpreter yeah and they and they did it in, in in hardware wow and that worked sort of i mean they were they were they were they were nice machines they never really got traction the the Carnegie Mellon computer science department um, bought a, a boatload of them um they they never really got hugely useful um but perk by the way as i'm told stood for pascal engine that runs quicker (laughs) i did not know that (laughs) it kind of makes sense (laughs) yeah but but anyway at, at 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 one point um the you know the the VAC 780s started rolling in, yeah, and um, I, I I had two thesis advisors, and one of them was this guy named uh, Raj Reddy, who is quite a character. Um, but at one point, he he asked me to um, if if I could figure out how to get the um, the software that they had on the perk to run on the VAC 780. And I think he, he what he had sort of in mind was that I would write a Pascal compiler. Um, but he didn't actually tell me to do that. He just said, get the software to run. And sort of being lazy, I wanted to do it sort of the easiest way I could find. Um, and and so I tried writing a translator from the, 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 the P code that the UCSD compilers spat out. Um, into VAX 11780 machine code. And that worked shockingly better than I had expected. (laughs) Um, I was actually getting better code quality than the C compiler. Wow. Um, And and there were some things about the, 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 the P code that made it a little awkward. Um, but it worked really well. And, and um, you know, I sort of realized that, you know, I could, I could generate code for kind of anything. It didn't have to be a VAX. Um, All you and, had to do is write a virtual machine that would interpret that byte yeah, code, the and, decode and on was, that And there hardware. was a, a, a lot of discussion in the, in the um, sort of computer, in the sort of the compiler universe about, you know, what was usually called at those days an architecture neutral uh, distribution format. And um, and I thought, well, gee, this is a really because what everybody was doing was doing these 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 strange serialized forms of parse trees, and and this was in fact a, an instruction set. But if you stood back from the instruction set, it was really a a Polish encoded version of a uh, of a parse tree. Um, but it was a way that that had a, a technique for doing it that had a very clean definition and um i thought that there was probably there was probably like a phd thesis to be had in there (laughs) and um you know my my thesis committee basically said no it can't be a phd thesis unless there's like theorems and math so (laughs) um it's it's, so i i I thought it like gave up on that um but then when we were doing this this project at sun years later um, one of the problems that the 
folks in the consumer electronics industry had was that you know every time they they built a new device they had to write all their code right. from ground zero and they they wanted to view cpus as um just sort of interchangeable units right that they could buy from this supplier they could buy from that supplier and um Software doesn't really work that way in the in the the sort of standard case, right? You you compile your software for a particular instruction set, and then you're wedded to that. And then what that means is that if you've built a VCR and you've written the software for it, if you decide to switch suppliers, you're screwed. You're 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 really stuck with that one supplier kind of forever. And the consumer electronics companies hated that. Oh yeah. So they wanted um, some way that they could switch processor chips, um, and and even it wasn't even just you know big switches like from one instruction set to another, but from one version of an instruction set to another, because by then the the sort of pain of versioning was already on them, um, and you know as we were doing this 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 tour of you know Asia and and Europe and talking to all these consumer electronics companies that was that was one of the themes of 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 pain for them and i and then i sort of thought you know i kind of did this almost phd thesis project that works <laughs> shockingly well um and i could solve that problem for them um and it would actually work pretty well um I and mean, that was that was kind of like like you know one of the starting points it's kind of counterintuitive because it seems like you're adding another layer. You're adding interpretation. I understand the value of writing once and then having it run everywhere. You only have to create a virtual machine for individual devices. Uh, why? How is it that it's efficient? Well, so 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 one of the things that that's 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 really important is the way that the the virtual machine does this this just in time compiling. JIT. Um, the the JIT. So the, there are a bunch of things that come out of having a a just in time compiler. Um, you know, one of them is you actually know the machine that's running on. Now, in for for lots of folks, you know, the the write C code, they say, well, I'm running on an x86. Um, but yeah, you know, the x86 architecture comes in you know a hundred flavors. And the, you know, the optimal way of, you know, writing a matrix multiplier or a copy loop on, on one flavor of x86 is, is different from another flavor of x86. Um, but doesn't the compiler, the C compiler, well, the, the C, handle most, that and optimize for the Most C compilers the have like 10,000 command line options a lot of switches yeah a lot of switches i mean if you look at the command line options of any c compiler oh, yeah. it's like a long long list right? <laughs> right so you know if you know the exact model of of like intel cpu chip that you're targeting you can put the right set of command line arguments in there and you'll get something that's optimized for that right but you know when you look at a, at a data center um they didn't buy all their cpu chips at the same time Right. You know, so you end up with, you know, a data center that, that's, you know, you're trying to do some large scale cloud computation and um, you take this thing and you, you know, roll it out over all the, the, the processors in a, in a data center and they're all, you know, slightly different, can, slightly different chips. So the, 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 the JIT compiler can compile things for exactly the machine that it lands on. So with a, like a lot of the, the like large scale data center stuff, if you looked at the code that was executing on on one machine versus another, they will be slightly different. Um, and and because it you know because it looks um, at you know exactly that machine, um, you know. But there's also the, the the fact that you know when you're writing an optimizer for a C compiler, you can optimize the 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 routine in front of you. And it's very difficult to do optimizations that span boundaries between between functions, um, and and in particular if the functions are, um, you know, loaded into you know, are parts of different libraries 
Um, it's very difficult to do sort of cross-library optimizations. Whereas once you're in a, in a JIT compiler, um, it can reach across library boundaries and do crazy amounts of inlining. Um, and it's really the, 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 the sort of large-scale inlining where uh -huh. the, the, the biggest gains happen because, you know, you've written your piece of code that's calling some crypto library. And, you know, if you then look at the code that's actually running, there's no call to the crypto library, right? right? It's, right. it's taken the, 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 the whole, all the pieces of the crypto library and inlined it. And if you're calling some routine and, and you give it a, like a constant as, a, as one parameter, you know, the, the constant collapsing will happen at runtime. Right. Um, and and the, the compiler is able to do all kinds of speculative optimizations. That's, in, that's really interesting. So yeah. uh, you're not loading all these libraries uh, and linking them in and all this stuff. You've got the code right there, and it just runs. And that, that makes sense, especially in a big system. That makes sense you're going to get a, a real improvement in performance. Yeah, so, 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 so if you look at, the, at like, like benchmarks that are just you know, single isolated tight, tight loops, yeah. Um, C compilers tend to win, right. although the, the, you know the Java JIT tends to do pretty well too. But as soon as you start looking at benchmarks that um, span large, large pieces of code that that have a lo lot of interlinks between between libraries, um, that makes sense. The, the JIT compiler just walks away with it. it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and of course, Java was it an instant success? Or did it, did it, I remember very well uh, in the 94 or 95, Kim Police coming and showing us this new thing that uh, the, everybody was going to move to. And by the way, it is a huge success. It's right now the number one most used language in the world, I think. Um, but was it an uh, instant? Yeah, it's, it's a, astonishing that it, that it, you know. It's amazing, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, and partly because uh, it's not just people using Java. They're, the JVM... Is being used by, and I know you worked for a Scala company for a while. It's been closure. Well, I, I, so I, many I, other. I've been on an advisory board. With advisory them. board, yeah. So many other languages on top of it. The JVM is a brilliant uh, abstraction that uh, is powering probably a, a significant portion of the software everybody watching is using, including, of course, and we'll get to this in a moment, <laughs> your Android device. Not not without some some problems along the way. Uh, but was it was it an interesting success out of the box? I mean, uh, did, did did people yeah, jump, I mean, jump it on was, it? it was it was it was really different. Um, you know, my 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 wife sort of beat me into writing this um, uh, white paper that was the, the that was the sort of series of stories of how it solved different problems, and um, lots of people sort of grabbed onto it and went, "Hey, this is really really cool." and um, I was completely blown away, um, you know, when there was a, there was a point where, you know, you know, when you have a, you know, when you work for a company, you often have to write out your like annual goals. And as we were coming up to sort of, you know, we had sort of decided that this should go from being a research project to something that we would distribute. Um, I, you know, my, my manager asked me to like write something in my goals for, you know, what would count as success. And I think my, my, my success goal was, was like, you know, if a thousand people downloaded it and tried it out, I'd consider that success. <laughs> and, and, um, um, the, my the sort of manager at the time, um, he, he, he thought I was being, pretty edgy. He thought that that would be kind of difficult to achieve. Um, and I rather grotesquely overachieved on that one. <laughs> Oracle today says there's six and a half million Java programmers in the world. I bet you that number's low. And uh, every time I install Java now, it says something like, there, did you know there are a billion devices running Java? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I mean part, of the, part of that math is sort of is sort of strange because um, Java is at the core of the most of the, the, the smart card specs. So um, 
you know, all, you know, they're, 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 they're Java virtual machines, you know, inside smart cards. No kidding. Really? Uh, and inside, uh, SIM cards and cell phones. You're kidding. There's an actual yeah. JVM inside this, in that little dumb chip. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and they're 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 like like um, you know lots of ID cards. That's amazing. Uh, well, lots of the more advanced ID cards have JVMs in them. That's a proof of concept. How did your wife know that you should do that? Is she a computer scientist? No, no, but um, she you know shows so 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 my wife's a, a very sharp lady, um, you know one of these sort of Wharton MBA types, um, and. You know, I'd be like really excited about what I was doing, and you know, being a nerd, I'd I'd always you know express my excitement in sort of nerd speak, and um, she was she was always like, "Come on, you know, you, you know, when you're explaining something, um, it makes no sense to like dive into nerd speak. It's like." <laughs> For me, a non-nerd, what problems does this solve? That's a good point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And 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 that's been a, sort of a mantra for me, you know, e e you know, ever since um, that, you know, if you've got something exciting, you have to, and you're trying to explain it to somebody, you have to explain it in terms that make sense to the listener, not the speaker. Right. You know, so so like like there was this list of like sort of a dozen cool things, and and so like like the the architecture neutral aspect of the of the byte codes, um, you know, the fact that 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 that, that meant that, for instance, a, a hardware manufacturer could could swap chips somewhat painlessly. Yeah. Um, you know that's not sort of exciting for a for a nerd, but it sure is exciting for a like a purchasing manager. Sure. Um, you know, so you have to you know explain it in a way that makes sense to your audience. And um, my wife spent a lot of time twisting my arm on that. <laughs> Nerds need need somebody to help explain what's going on <laughs> to real people. Yep. Yep. Uh, we're talking to James Gosling, the father of Java, officer of the Order of Canada. Uh, congratulations. He's also, uh, well, obviously, I don't need to tell you, he's quite esteemed a fellow of the ACM, uh, the Neumann, von Neumann medal winner, and, uh, and a great guy. And also a roboticist. We're going to talk about his, uh, what is it, liquid robotics in a little bit. But I... I also want to talk a little bit about because if this if Java were a rock band, and this were the uh, the show you know about the story of the rock, there's an arc you know and Java succeeds and then trouble then the trouble starts, and uh, and boy there's <laughs> Java has been fought over by some of the biggest tech companies in the world including Microsoft, Google, Oracle, its current owner, and I'm very curious in your take on uh, all of that. We won't go too. We won't go. We won't spend a long time belaboring that. But I'm just particularly about the Oracle versus Google uh, suit. I'm really curious what your thoughts are on that. Uh, but we're going to uh, take a break right now, and uh, we'll get back to more with James Gosling in just a little bit. Our show today brought to you by magazines, the best magazines in the world, and not just not just the, but the Netflix of magazines, a company that makes those magazines, puts all those magazines on your tablet or your phone, so you can read them whenever you want, even. If you don't have an internet connection, uh, for a flat monthly rate that is lower than just buying a couple of copies of that magazine. Now you know there's there's magazines. With, I would say there's probably two dozen magazines every month with an article I want to read, whether it's Vanity Fair or The New Yorker or uh, Esquire or Rolling Stone, Wired magazine. Okay, uh, every once in a while I want to see what's going on in People, but if I had subscriptions to all of those, it would add up to hundreds of dollars. Uh, if I bought copies of those on the newsstand, even more, and not to mention the clutter. This is this is decluttering your coffee table because all of those magazines are more available to you right there on your tablet. It is, it, we're all these days binge watching TV. Well, now you can binge read magazines, the best magazines ever. And you know, I have to say texture is really saving this medium. It's a great medium. Uh, articles that are, they're thoughtful. Uh, articles that are engaging, 
pictures too. You get National Geographic and Architectural Digest. Uh, I just love browsing through those, getting ideas. Uh, look at all the magazines. Go to texture.com slash triangulation. You can try it free right now. It works, as I said, on your phone or your tablet. It is the full magazine, by the way. Every page that you would get on the newsstand, plus back issues. So uh, you're getting it all. Even bonus, uh, bonus articles, uh, bonus features like video that you couldn't put in a magazine. Consumer Reports, Cosmopolitan. Uh, I just, I've, you know, Cycle World. Dwell is another one. I love to just look at the ideas and dwell. It's always a lot of fun. So... You also get uh, easy-to-find articles about topics you care about. Their curated collections will point you in the right direction. So if you've never read Decor magazine, but th there's an article in there you'd be interested in, you can find those very quickly. They've really reimagined the magazine reading experience, and you're going to love it. Try it for free right now. Get insider access to all the content from the world's most in-demand publications. Star your favorite magazines. They'll instantly be added to your personal library, downloaded before your next trip. You can even share your subscription with your family. Okay, now now I'm talking, huh? Lisa shares hers with me. That's how I know that. Texture.com slash triangulation. Sign up and get that free trial. It is a great idea. Kind of Netflix for magazines. We, uh, You may remember the name Next Issue. We did ads for them for a long time. This is They've rebranded, so this is Next Issue. Uh, but it's called Texture now. Texture, and I like that name actually, texture.com, because it's every issue. Dot triangulation. My grandma used to have in her basement a wall of National Geographics. Now it's all on an iPad. You can have hundreds of years or whatever, how many issues they have on your iPad. Texture.com slash triangulation. Our guest is, uh, what, is there a title if you are an officer of the uh, Order of... Canada? Do I call you Sir James Gosling? I I think if the if the Order of Canada were were a British thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. you'd be something. Um, but 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 Canadians don't do that. <laughs> They're too so nice. That's not a part of the thing. <laughs> Must have felt good though. Um, so uh, you were at, you stayed at Sun a long time. In fact, uh, you stayed right through the acquisition by Oracle. Right. Um, uh, moved on to it for a few months. We're at Google, I think I remember. Yeah, I was there for about six months. Yeah, um, which which must have been an interesting uh, thing, given the fact that uh, almost immediately Oracle and Google. Well, you you write uh, that uh, during the integration meetings between Sun and Oracle, we were being grilled about the patent situation between Sun and Google. We could see the Oracle lawyer's eyes sparkle. Uh, Oracle, I'm sure, believed that they could recoup some of the cost of uh, acquiring Sun um, in this lawsuit. So what was the issue about? Google says it was clean room. We didn't copy Java code. We just copied the APIs. It seems to be about APIs. Um, you know, it's, it, it's hard to know what the truth really was. Right. I mean, before, um, you know, before all of that, um, Google had been in intense negotiation with us to um, get a license for Java and use use RVM in Android. Yeah, in Android. Um, we sort of had this had this problem with the, I mean, they just wanted it for free. Um and you know we had this this problem that we had a lot of engineers working on it and you know we you know while we were giving away java for like enterprise use um we were charging like like phone companies and that for for embedded stuff in handsets um you know we we, we kind of had to have a way to pay the salaries of all these engineers Right. And and Google wanted us to have all these engineers working for them for free. And, um, you know, we, you know, wanted something. Right. You know, the, you know, they they had a very clear revenue model based on based on advertising. And um, they were completely unwilling to uh, do anything to, 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 to help us, you know, pay the bills. Um, 
And, you know, we, we had offered them a price that, you know, in retrospect was like way small. Um, they, they, they spent way more on lawyers yeah. than, 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 than they ever would have if they had just, you know, paid the, 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 the license we offered them. Um, and, you know, Google is a bunch of people and, you know, individuals all have different ways of operating and, um, you know, the, 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 you know, we got, uh, a fairly, I just want to, I keep wanting to like, like, like devolve into, into a pro, a, a rant of profanity here, <laughs> but I'll, 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 I'll not do that. Okay. Um, Although if you wanted to, it'd be, uh, be good for ratings. Yeah, I, I suppose. <laughs> I'm um, not going to stop you. <laughs> but but we sort of parted company, um, yeah. you know. You know, felt f feeling that that they had been um, fairly abusive. And they say and they that, didn't. They didn't though. They wrote their own, basically. That Dalvik, the 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 JB. Yeah, is yeah. Their and they, own. they came out with that later. Ah. And uh. and yeah, they wrote the 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 Dalvik VM. Um, exactly where the source code for some of their libraries and that came from um who knows i mean in the in the in the discovery process they the you know a lot of the code looked really similar oh interesting and then and then, uh, then their code base changed over time and uh, and uh, since i wasn't actually involved in the lawsuit um you know i never got to see the insides of anything right but um, you know, there are, you know, from the, from the, from the sun side, um, we weren't very happy. Um, you but, used the word sl Google slimed us. Yeah, that was kind of how that, that was kind of the consensus opinion. Um, but you know, Scott is not, not someone who likes to get involved in lawsuits. And, and so even though, you know, we were fairly unhappy with them, um, before Oracle's acquisition. Yeah, long before Oracle's yeah. acquisition. Yeah. Um, we decided to just let it slide because it would just it would just turn into a Well what uh, it, what it did turn into. <laughs> an endless Yeah, it was just it was just gonna get it, 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 it just didn't feel that, you know, whatever right and wrong was, there was there there was no good path. Yeah. Um and and and, and so they just sort of did their thing and um, you know, then, 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 then Oracle takes over and, and, you know, Oracle is, Oracle is Oracle, right? They, they're, um, they're an organization that's driven by arithmetic and, and, the uh, you know, it's, it's the, it's the balance sheet at the end of the month. And, you know, here's this, you know, unharvested potential source of cash and, um, then, you know, they start coming up with, you know, legal arguments to try to make things stick. And, you know, what's good, right, what's bad, what's right, what's wrong. Boy, oh boy, that's just like too sticky for me. Yeah. You know, when it comes to this case, I, I, I kind of feel like, 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 um, you know, there are no good guys in this one. Yeah, I mean, I, I would hate to see, uh, you know, a, a, a law or a ruling that APIs are copyrightable because that would have a, a chilling effect across the whole. Yeah, that that would be bad. Um, but it, it, it kind of feels like, um, you know, the, the, the lawyers and laws and legal teams are, they, they do what they can. That's where they decided to pursue it. But it sounds like there's actually uh, something a lot more actionable, but they decided they can't pursue that. By the way, just in case you're curious, because, uh, you know, when you mention this Oracle Google lawsuit, then the first thing people say is, oh, wait a minute, that wasn't that, isn't that over? Didn't the jury say that Google didn't infringe? Yeah, but then then Federal Circuit of Court of Appeals reversed the decision. Uh, and the second trial, new trial is scheduled for uh, May next month. And Oracle is now seeking $9.3 billion in damages. So uh, we have not seen the end of uh, this sad. It's not the end of Java by any means. That's the good news. Java is going strong. You used to do at uh, Java 1, you used to do a toy talk at the end of Java 1. You used to, 
What? Tell me about some of the toys uh, these days you're seeing that things that people are doing with Java that you like. Um, it's kind of all over the map. It's everywhere, I mean, isn't it? Yeah. You know, the it, it, it's 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 really entertaining to see what 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 people do. Um, you know, like like in the Raspberry Pi world, it's it's kind of like all over the place. Um, Minecraft is written in Java. Let's not yeah, forget. Yeah, which I find really, really ironic that you know, M Minecraft had become um, one of the biggest teaching platforms for Java programming. That's right. You know, all these all these young kids learning how to do Minecraft mods, um, and all this like course material about you know how to how to how to make your own you know sword with certain magical powers. Yeah. Um, you know how to build. You know, you know a a a a ship that can fly and harvest electricity and turn it into lightning bolts <laughs> to smite your enemies. Um, you, you know, as a as a vehicle to learn. And then and then Microsoft buys it. Isn't that ironic? Well, you yeah. worked for Microsoft brief, and Microsoft isn't. I don't even want to go down this road, but. Microsoft also said, "Oh, you know, we don't want to pay for Java, and uh, oh my, it's uh, Apple too. It, the whole thing is a mess." Yeah, yeah the, 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 uh, actually, you know, with with Microsoft and and Apple, money was never an issue. Um, you know, the control was always an issue, right? Right. The, you want a plat You want a, a platform that is universal. You don't want Microsoft Java. You don't want Apple well, well, Java. So, so, so a lot depends on your point of view, right? If you're a software developer, um, you know, the, the kind of universe you'd like to live in is one where, you know, you can write some application and you can sell it to people who buy Apple computers or you can sell it to people who buy, right. uh, you, know, you know, Windows PCs. And, uh, but, but if you're... Um, if you're a computer manufacturer, if you're an OS vendor, mm -hmm. what um, what most people want is um, what at Sun we used to call the 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 Roach Motel model. Yeah. Namely, you know, the roaches check in, but they never check out. Right. Do you remember those TV ads? I do. <laughs> um, I know exactly yeah, so, what you're talking about the minute you said it. <laughs> right, and 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 and, and so. You know when 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 Microsoft originally signed on as a um, as a Java licensee, the the all the people involved in that were were wonderful. They they did they did great great work. Um, that lasted about a year, yeah. and there was this like grand email from Bill Gates that came up in one of the antitrust case cases that that. Uh, that, that that had this line, you know, Microsoft does not work that way, right? You know, and and so it was all like all about control. You know, That's and, sad. And 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 a, and a similar sort of thing happened happened with Apple. I mean, in the in the early days um, when when Steve Jobs had come back to Apple, and and Apple was trying to make a cup Mac, and they were desperate for developers. Um, they were very enthusiastic about about java and they worked really well and and steve jobs actually gave a talk at java one uh one year and you know i spent the whole time before that you know you know with him um and and that was great they were really enthusiastic um but you know apple has always been about control they they, they want to control their own destiny and um, you know, I I'm a big fan of of Apple products. I use them all the time. I'm you know the laptop in front of me is a Mac. Um, you know, but they 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 you know really put the freak in control freak. Yeah. Um, and that has its has its good things and it has its bad things. And well, to their credit, you know, it is running a form of BSD. So. Uh, yeah, although uh, these days, not something that a real BSD person would call BSD. Why don't you run uh, OpenBSD or FreeBSD or some variant of the... Um, uh, you mean on why, yeah, the... Why don't you use it? You're a Unix guy. Or Linux. 
Yeah, I mean, it, we, you know, in the Linux part of my life, I I normally use Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's more because most of the packages I want to use are more likely to be extensively tested and right. and QA'd. Right. You know, in my heart of hearts, I would much rather use use BSD. Um, you know, these days, if only because they've they 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 they've got ZFS and integrated mm -hmm. into the core of it, mm -hmm. and ZFS is is uh, unbelievable. And another um, great sun invention. Yeah. Well, it, you know, we we spent a lot of time on it, and yeah. and I'm 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 really heartbreaking broken how um, Oracle has completely. Um, I guess screwed the pooch is the phrase I was trying to avoid. But there was briefly Apple was briefly said to be considering uh, ZFS instead of HFS for its file system. They abandoned that at some point, um, which yeah. is a great shame. Yeah, it's not entirely clear what what went on there. I mean, they were very close to releasing, and um, our CEO at the time, Jonathan, sort of pre-announced it. And um, exactly what happened, I'm not sure, yeah. but you know the the general rumor mill at the time was that you know Steve Jobs went, no, we control the message. Ugh. Well, there is a there. It is possible to use ZFS in Linux, but you have to recompile the kernel to re, to rebuild the kernel from source to do it. Uh, I've been tempted. Yeah, it's got it's gotten easier than that. You can actually dynamically link. Oh, that's good. It's in, but oh, that's good. In in BSD, it's completely trivial. Right. I keep, I'm very tempted. I keep wanting to, to install OpenBSD on one of my systems, or maybe just build a BSD system. Be kind of nice to have. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about the Wave Glider. Your current uh, job is uh, writing software for robotic submarines. It's not a submarine. Oh, what is it? It, it? It's actually on the surface. Oh, I apologize. I've been calling it. It's yeah. an ocean robot. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you, if, you, if you look me up on Vimeo, you'll find a, a, a video that sort of shows how it works. But uh, a wave glider is um, essentially, a, you know, if you took a surfboard and a kayak and you kind of <laughs> melded them together... Um, and then there's this this oh that's um, cool and then there's this umbilical cable that goes down about twenty feet and there's this oh you've got it there yeah yeah so there you see the the wave glider and then down below it there's this cable that links to this wave rack wing rack sorry and and it's got these these wings that go up and down there's, there's springs that 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 dampen their motion. And so the the wave glider is up in the ocean, and uh, up on the surface where it bounces up and down. The wing rack is down where the ocean is calm, and so it uses that differential to generate forward thrust, kind of way, the way that a whale's tail works. So the the float is up in the waves, and and we often tow instruments. How interesting! Uh, and you have, and of course, the other reason to have something up in the waves is for solar uh, power. Yeah, so, so we get all of our electricity from the solar panels on top, and we get forward thrust from the, from the wing rack. Wow. And both of, both of those are totally infinite. Um, the wave gliders can stay, stay out in, in the ocean for months and months and months. And what's not really clear is that the, you know, for, is that the, the device is incredibly robust. Um, you know, our, our design point is, 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 you know, a category five hurricane. We're pretty much wow. the only ocean going thing that, that, that will happily go into hurricanes. Um, and, and so the, the device is really a platform for instruments and you can bolt onto it all kinds of things. And the, 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 the tow bodies, the, in, in, in that animation, there was a thing towed behind those often will contain things like, like acoustics. Um, so one of the one of the things that we do is is mar marine protected area enforcement. So we we can listen for 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 poachers. Ah. Um, and and that's a that's a pretty cool thing to do. But also, you know, a lot of scientists will do things like measuring water chemistry, measuring ocean acidification, um, 
you can put like salinity sensors on on them and you know measure everything fr from like you know the the melting of the greenland ice caps to um you know what's 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 going on with with the uh, with ice in the arctic um you know we do arctic missions uh, fairly frequently um there's several uh, hundred of these uh out there yeah yeah and you know you know they, they they work as weather stations they can do pollution monitoring around oil 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 rigs um they're fully autonomous yeah yeah wow. so the, the 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 software on board is a big bag of java code and there's a fairly sophisticated AI system in it that that you you give it a mission and it goes and does the mission. Uh, you can modify the mission on the fly over the satellite link, and and you know some of the sensor data comes back over the satellite link. Um, but you know the satellite link is slow and erratic, so the vessel has to be able to go for a long time without any communication with the shore. Um, and you know, so if so, if they're doing a long transit, you know, so like um, we've got one right now just coming back from the Pitcairn Islands, and um, where we've been doing fisheries enforcement with it, and it's um, I don't know if you look in the on a map where Pitcairn Island is, but it's way in the South Pacific. Isn't um, that where the uh, bounty mutineers got stuck? Exactly. Yeah. It's, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's uh, remote. It's, it's kind of an entertaining place, but I bet. you know, rather than um, you know, fly down there to to, to install an instrument and deinstall it, um, we just have them swim home when it you know it, it. That's so cool. You know that 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 one needs to have its hull scrubbed, so we're just having it swim home to Hawaii. That is so cool. You know, and it takes a few weeks, but um, you know, you just you just say. Come home and it comes home. How do you uh, right. uh, avoid getting clobbered by uh, other shipping traffic? Uh, well, that's where the AI part comes in. Uh, one of the more entertaining pieces of code I had to work right a couple of years ago was, oh, you've actually got one of my demo I simulations. I kind of knew the answer before I asked the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, here's the Java code. Yeah, so it's it's actually pretty good at at going you know at, you know you give it um, a um, sort of a, a, a mission plan and the mission plan can have obstacles and then sort of dynamic obstacles can sort of flow into that and you know you can see where the the the, the wave glider has sort of deviated off to right. the side. Right. Um, you know it 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 avoids the ships and it works its way around the obstacles and. You know, tries to say on the on the target line that it, it was told to go from you know between those dots that are kind of cyan colored, um, and it had those obstacles in the way. And so just, and that, just swim uh, around them. Yeah, it's it swims around them quite nicely, and um, the you know it's able to to sort out like if there are multiple ships that it has to dodge at the same time, it does all that. And, you know, do, writing that kind of code in C is really, really hard. You end up with data structures that are really hard to reclaim, inevitable memory leaks. Yeah. Um, but it's pretty, pretty straightforward to do that kind of stuff in Java. Um, you know, so all of those, all of those sort of like control algorithms get, get much, much, much simpler um, when you've got a language like, like Java to work with. Um, so yeah, it's been pretty entertaining, and you know some of the some you know it, it's been hard to get people to believe that it can actually do collision avoidance well. Um, some of the incidents have been you know pretty comical. Um, <laughs> Boats you know, trying the, to avoid it as it's avoiding the boat, and yeah. Oh, we we, we have After this. After you, Alphonse. You know, you know, really early on, you know, the actually the the, the first time we we uh, launched a wave glider with the with the the collision avoidance stuff in it, um, our Engineering crews, you know, a few days later, and I went to go pick up the boat, pick up the wave glider because we needed needed to fuss with it, and um, it I, I got ended up with this this phone call with a you know screaming boat crew because um, <laughs> they couldn't pick it up. Oh, because it was avoiding them. It was avoiding them. <laughs> they spent an hour trying to pick this thing up, <laughs> and and. And I said, just turn collision avoidance off. <laughs> you can't pick it up. <laughs> and, and 
good. <laughs> we've, we've had a couple of customers do the do the same thing. That's hysterical. Um, you know, and you know, our 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 operation center has gotten these like irate phone calls <laughs> from customers, and it's like, damn it, don't you like it when software actually works? <laughs> it's nice. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of software running James Gosling's code. We owe a lot to the father of Java, and not just Java programs. As I mentioned, there are a great many other programs sitting on top of the JVM, including Python and uh, Jython, I guess it's called, and, and there's a JRuby, and uh, I love Clojure. Clojure sits on top of the JVM. Uh, it's and really Scala. And Scala, of course, yeah. It's, uh, it's really proven to be a, an incredibly robust system. Uh, and, of course, anybody who has an Android phone, darn it, <laughs> you can thank this guy. <laughs> if you want to send him a check, I, I'm sure he'll <laughs> accept donations. Uh, don't send him to Oracle, though. They don't deserve it. Thank you, James Gosling. I'm going to call you Sir James Gosling. Uh, a real pleasure to talk to you. And uh, Well, and thank you for inviting me. Yeah, lots of fun. And thank you so much uh, for creating Java and, uh, and changing the world. Yeah, well, it's been fun. Yeah, I, I'm enjoying being a, being a user these days. So. Isn't that nice? You get to use your own creation. Yeah, yeah. What kind of computer is on those wave riders? Um, let's see. The most of the ones that are swimming right now have a um, a TI OMAP mm -hmm. six thousand series ARM processor on them. Um, and we, you know, we've been doing a lot of stuff with uh, the NVIDIA. Um, um, PK ones and TX ones that we we put in like payload boxes and um, we're starting the work of converting over to using like the TX one everywhere, which you know at like a teraflop, it just just makes my head explode. It's so <laughs> it's wonderful. I mean it, the things I'm going to be able to do once that's real. You're seeing the strength though of this whole idea of a virtual machine is it doesn't matter you just swap out the processor you want to oh, yeah. you want to no, work with great. arm no big deal you know Yeah we we built up a prototype machine with a TX1 in it and you know it has like more cores and a different instruction set and all the rest of that and it just freaking worked That's neat Have you do you write the JVMs have you have you written JVMs or is that uh, how hard is that to do is that a Well I wrote the very first one Mhm mm um, the if you try to do a, do a basic JVM that just does like interpreting the byte codes, that's really easy. Doesn't take much work at all to write that. Um, you can actually get something moderately workable in a in a weekend. Wow. Um, if you try to get like really high performance with a really good garbage collector. That's many man years, you know. I mean, people right. call me the inventor of Java, the father of Java, but in fact, I've done such a small fraction of the work involved in making Java be what it is. I mean, the engineering team that works on the JDK is terrific. Yeah. Way yeah. smarter than I am. Well, we thank you, and uh, I thank you for your time today. It's been great talking to you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, James. We uh, talked to some of the best minds. I tell you, it's so much fun doing this show, and I hope you see and watch every one of them. And, of course, you don't have to watch them live, although it's always fun. We start at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, that's 1,800 UTC on every Monday, and great guests aplenty. Uh, but if you can't watch live, you can always get on demand audio and video of everything we do at twit.tv. In the case of this show, it's twit.tv slash TRI. Uh, that's... You know, the, that's where it starts, but of course, iTunes and uh, any podcast application, you could subscribe, get it every single week. You can, you'll find it on, uh, we have uh, Twit apps. We didn't write any of them, uh, written for every platform. I'm sure there's one in Java uh, on the Windows uh, platform, on the iOS, the Android. Well, there is Android. Uh, on um, uh, Apple TV, there's five Twit apps. People just seem to like to write Twit apps, Roku. So find one, get the show, subscribe, and that way you won't miss an episode. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time on Triangulation. Bye-bye.